Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to kick off this new year with some shout-outs to quite a list of new Patreon supporters. Mark Diane Athena, Neil, Freya, Jody, Kendra, Bridget, Adam, Bronwyn, Rachel, and James and his lovely daughter Anne. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, You help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you're interested in supporting Boring Books for Bedtime and learning more about the perks available to subscribers, including exclusive episodes heard nowhere else, you'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. You'll also find a link to buymeacoffee.com where you can support us with a one-time tip, no subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly, and off we go. Tonight, let's respond to a reader request and fight off the chilly weather with more from Fairylands of the South Seas by James Norman Hall and Charles Bernard Nordoff. First published in 1921 by Harper and Brothers Publishers, New York and London. Let's pick up right where we left off at the beginning of chapter two. Let's begin. Chapter two, In the Cloud of Islands. Ruau, the old Pamatuan woman and the owner of Tanao was the last of her family. There were relatives by marriage but none of them would consent to live on so poor an atoll, and the original population, never large, had diminished through death and migration, until at last she was left alone, living in her memories of other days, awed by the companionship of spirits present to her in strange and terrible shapes. At last she felt that she could endure it no longer, but it was many months before the smoke of one of her signal fires was seen by a passing schooner. She returned with it to Tahiti, and if she had been lonely before, she was tenfold lonelier there, so far from the graves of her husband and children. It was at this time that Crichton met her. He had been living at Tahiti for more than a year, on the lookout for just such an opportunity as Ruao offered him. Although only twenty-eight, he was in the tenth year of his wanderings, and had almost despaired of finding the place he had so long dreamed of and searched for. During that period he had been moving slowly eastward, through Borneo, New Guinea, the Solomons, the New Hebrides, the Tongas, the Cook Group. In some of these islands, the climate was too powerful an enemy for a white man to contend with. In others, there was no land available, or they lacked the solitude he wanted. This latter embarrassment was the one he had met at Tahiti. The fact is an illuminating commentary on his character. Most men would find exceptional opportunities for seclusion there, not on the seaboard, but in the mountains, in the valleys winding deeply among them, 
where no one goes from year's end to year's end. Even those leading out to the sea are but little frequented in their upward reaches. But Crichton was very exacting in his requirements in this respect. He was one of those men who make few or no friends, one of those lonely spirits without the ties or the kindly human associations which make life pleasant to most of us. They wander the thinly peopled places of the earth, interested in a large way at what they see from afar or faintly hear, but looking on with quiet eyes, taking no part, being blessed or cursed by nature with a love of silence, of the unchanging peace of great solitudes. One reads of them now and then in fiction, and if they live in fiction, it is because of men like Crichton, their prototypes in reality. He had a little place at Tahiti, a walk of two hours and a quarter, he said, from the government offices in the port. He had to go there sometimes to attend to the usual formalities, and I have no doubt that he knew within ten seconds the length of the journey which would be a very distasteful one to him. I can imagine his uneasiness at what he saw and heard on those infrequent visits. And after the war renewal of activity, talk of trade, development, progress, would startle him into a waiting, listening attitude. Returning home, maps and charts would be got out, and plans made against the day when it would be necessary for him to move on. He told me of his accidental meeting with Ruau, as he called the old Palmatuan woman. It came only a few days after the arrival from San Francisco of one of the monthly steamers. A crowd of tourists, stopover passengers of a day, had somehow discovered the dim trail leading to his house. They were much pleased with it, he said, adding with restraint, they took a good many pictures. I was rather annoyed at this, although of course I said nothing. No doubt they made the usual remarks. Charming, so quaint, etc., it was the last straw for Crichton, so he made another visit to the government offices, where he had his passport viséed. He meant to go to Makatea, a high phosphate island which stands like a gateway at the northwestern approach to the low archipelago. The phosphate would be worked out in time and the place abandoned as other islands of that nature had been, to the seabirds. But on that same evening, while he was having dinner at a Chinaman's shop in town, he overheard Ruao trying to persuade some of her relatives to return with her to Tanao. He knew of the island. He is one of the few men who would know of it. He had often looked at it on his charts, being attracted by its isolated position, the very place for him. And the old woman, he said, when she learned that he wanted to go there, that he wanted to stay always, all his life, gripped his hands in both of hers and held them, crying softly, without saying anything more. The relatives made some objections to the arrangement at first, but the island being remote, poverty-stricken, haunted, they were soon persuaded to consent to a ten years lease with the option of renewal. Crichton promised, of course, to take care of Ruau as long as she lived, and at her death to bury her decently beside her husband. He proceeded at once with his altered plans. There were government regulations to be complied with, and these had taken some time. On the day when he was at last free to start, 
he learned that the Caleb S. Winship was about to sail on a three-month voyage in the low archipelago. He had no time to ask for passage beforehand. He had to chance the possibility of getting it at the last moment. It is not to be supposed that either the manager of the Inter-Island Trading Company or the supercargo of the windship would have consented to carry him to such an out-of-the-way destination had they known his reason for wanting to be set down there. It amuses me now to think of those two hard-headed traders, men without a trace of sentiment, going 150 miles off their course merely to carry the least gregarious of wanderers on the last leg of his long journey to an ideal solitude. It was their curiosity which gained him his end. They believed he had some secret purpose, some reason of purely material self-interest in view. They had both seen to now from a distance and knew that it had never been worth visiting either for pearl shell or copra. It is hard to understand what miracle they believed might have taken place in the meantime. During the voyage, I often heard them talking about the atoll, about Crichton, wondering, conjecturing, and always miles off the track. It was plain that he was a good deal disturbed by their hints and furtive questionings. He seemed to be afraid that mere talk about Tanao on the part of an outsider might sully the purity of its loneliness. He may have been a little selfish in his attitude, but if that is a fault in a man of his temperament, it is one easily forgiven. And what could he have said to those traitors? It was much better to keep silent and let them believe what they liked. It must not be thought that Crichton poured out his confidences to me like a schoolgirl. On the contrary, he had a very likable reserve, although a good half of it, I should say, was shyness. Then, too, he had almost forgotten how to talk, except in the native dialects of several groups of widely scattered islands. In English, he had a tendency to prolong his vowels, and to omit consonants, which gave his speech a peculiar exotic sound. He made no advances for some time, neither did I. For more than three weeks we lived together on shipboard, went ashore together at islands, where we had put in for copra, and all that while we did not exchange above two hundred words in conversation. There was so little talk, I can remember the whole of it, almost word for word. Once while we were walking on the outer beach at Raraka, an atoll of thirty-five inhabitants, he said to me, I wish I had come out here years ago. They appeal to the imagination, don't you think? All these islands. His volubility startled me. It was a shock to the senses, like the crash of a coconut on a tin roof, heard in the profound stillness of an island night. There was my opportunity to throw off reserve, and I lost it through my surprise. I merely said, yes, very much. An hour later we saw the captain, no larger than a penny doll, at the end of a long vista of empty beach, beckoning us to come back. We went aboard without having spoken again. It was an odd sort of relationship for two men thrown into close contact on a small trading schooner in the loneliest ocean in the world, as Nordhoff put it. We were no more companionable in the ordinary sense than a pair of hermit crabs. But the need for talking drops away from men under such circumstances, and neither of us found the long silences embarrassing. 
The spell of the islands was upon us both. I can understand Crichton speaking of their appeal to the imagination while we were in the midst of them, for our presence there seemed an illusion, a dream more radiant than any reality could be. In fact, my only hold upon reality during that voyage was the Caleb S. Windship, and sometimes even that substantial old vessel suffered sea changes, was metamorphosed in a moment, and it was hard to believe that she was a boat built by men's hands. Often as she lay at anchor in a lagoon of dreamlike beauty, I paddled out from shore in a small canoe, and making fast under her stern, spent an afternoon watching the upward play of the reflections from the water and the blue shadows underneath, rippling out and vanishing in the light like flames of fire. For me, her homely, rugged New England name was a pleasant link with the past. I liked to read the print of it. The word Boston, her old home port, was still faintly legible through a coat of white paint. It brought to mind old memories and the faces of old friends, hard to visualize in those surroundings without such practical help. Far below lay the floor of the lagoon, where all the rainbows of the world have authentic end. The water was so clear and the sunlight streamed through it with so little loss in brightness that one seemed to be suspended in mid-air above the forests of branching coral, the deep, cool valleys, and the wide, sandy plains of that strange continent. Crichton, I believe, was beyond the desire to keep in touch with the world he had left so many years before. His experiences there may have been bitter ones. At any rate, he never spoke of them, and I doubt if he thought of them often. People had little interest for him, not even those of the atolls which we visited. When on shore, I usually found him on the outer beaches, away from the villages which lie along the lagoon. In most of the atolls, the distance from beach to beach is only a few hundred yards, but the ocean side is unfrequented and solitary. On calm days, when the tide begins to ebb, the silence there is unearthly. The wide shore, hot and glaring in the sun, stretches away as far as the eye can reach, empty of life except for thousands of small hermit crabs moving into the shade of the palms. They snap into their shells at your approach and make fast the door of their houses fall with a sound like the tinkling of hailstones among heaps of broken coral. We waded along the shallows at low tide when the wind was on shore and a heavy surf breaking over the outer edge of the reef, we sat as close to it as we could, watching the seas gathering far out, rising in sheer walls fringed with wind-whipped spray, which seemed higher than the island itself as they approached. It was a fascinating sight the reef hidden in many places in a perpetual smoke of sunlight-filtered mist, through which the oncoming breakers could be seen dimly as they swept forward, curled, and fell. But one could not avoid a feeling of uneasiness, of insecurity, thinking of what had happened in those islands, most of them only a meter or two above sea level, in the hurricanes of the past, and of what would happen again at the coming of the next great storm. We made landfalls at dawn, in mid-afternoon, 
late at night, saw the islands in aspects of beauty exceeding one's strangest imaginings. We penetrated farther and farther into a thousand-mile area of atoll-dotted ocean, discharging our cargo of lumber and corrugated iron, rice and flour and canned goods, taking on copra, carrying native passengers from one place to another. Sometimes we were out of sight of land for several days, beating into headwinds under a slowly moving pageantry of clouds, which alone gave assurance of the rotundity of the earth. When at last land appeared, it seemed inaccessibly remote. At the summit of a long slope of water, which we would never be able to climb. Sometimes for as long a period, we skirted the shoreline of a single atoll, the water deepening and shoaling under our keel in splotches of vague or vivid coloring. From a vantage point in the rigging, one could see a segment of a vast circle of islands, strung at haphazard on a thread of reef which showed a thin, clear line of changing red and white under the incessant battering of the surf. Several times upon going ashore, we found the villages deserted, the inhabitants having gone to distant parts of the atoll for the copra-making season. In one village, we came upon an old man too feeble to go with the others, apparently sitting in the shade playing a phonograph. He had but three records. Away to the forest, the dance of the nymphs Scottish, and just a song at twilight. The discs were as old as the instrument itself, no doubt, and the needles so badly worn that one could barely hear the music above the rasping of the mechanism. There was a groove on the vocal record where the needle caught, and the singer, a woman with a high, quavery voice, repeated the same phrase, when the lights are low, over and over again. I can still hear it, even at this distance of time and place, and recall vividly to mind the silent houses the wide, vacant street, bright with fugitive sunshine, the lagoon at the end of it, mottled with the shadows of clouds. The sense of our remoteness grew upon me as the weeks and months passed. Once surrounding a point of land, we came upon two schooners lying inside the reef of a small atoll. One of them had left Papiti only a short while before. Her skipper gave us a bundle of old newspapers. Glancing through them that evening, I heard, as in a dream, the far-off clamor of the outside world, the shrieking of whistles, the roar of trains, the strident warnings of motors. But there was no reality no allurement in the sound. I saw men carrying trivial burdens with an air of immense effort, of grotesque self-importance, scurrying in breathless haste on useless errands, gorging food without relish, sleeping without refreshment, taking their leisure without enjoyment, living without the knowledge of content, dying without ever having lived. The pictures which came to mind as I read were distorted, untrue, no doubt, for by that time I was almost as much attracted by the lonely life of the islands as my friend Crichton. My old feeling of restlessness was gone. In its place had come a certitude of happiness, a sense of well-being, for which I can find no parallel this side of boyhood. It was largely the result of living among people 
who are as permanently happy, I believe, as it is possible for humankind to be. And the more remote the island, the more slender the thread of communication with civilization as we know it, the happier they were. It was not in my imagination that I found this true, or that I had determined beforehand to see only so much of their life as might be agreeable and pleasant to me. On the contrary, if I had any bias at first, it was on the other side. Disillusionment is a sad experience, and I had no desire to lay myself open to it. Therefore, I listened willingly to the less favorable stories of native character, which the traitors and others who know them had to tell, but summed up dispassionately later, in the light of my own observations, it seemed to me that the faults of character of which they were accused were more like the natural shortcomings of children. In many respects, the Palmatuans, like other divisions of the Polynesian family, are children who have never grown up, and one can't blame them for a lack of the artificial virtues which come only with maturity. They are without guile. They have little of the shrewdness or craftiness of some primitive peoples, at least so it appeared to me, making as careful a judgment of them as I could. I have often noticed how like children they are in their amazing trustfulness, their impulsive generosity, and in the intensity and briefness of their emotions. The more I saw of their life, the more desirable it seemed that they might continue to escape any serious encroachments of European or American civilization. They have no doctors, because illness is almost unknown in their islands. Crime, insanity, feeble-mindedness, evils all too common with us, are of such rare occurrence that one may say they do not exist. It may be said, too, without overstatement, that their community life very nearly approaches perfection. Every atoll is a little world to itself, with a population varying from 25 to perhaps 300 inhabitants. The chief, who is chosen informally by the men, serves a period of four years under the sanction of the French government. He has very little to do in the exercise of his authority, for the people govern themselves, are law-abiding without law. When I first learned that there are no schools throughout the islands, I thought the French guilty of criminal neglect, but later I reversed this opinion. After all, why should they have schools? No education of ours could make them more generous, more kindly disposed to one another, more hospitable and courteous toward strangers, happier than they are now. Certainly, it could not make them less selfish, covetous, rapacious, for most of them are as innocent of those vices as their own children. In a few of the richer, more accessible islands, they are slowly changing in these respects, owing to the example set them by men of our own race. In another fifty years, perhaps, they may have learned to believe that material wealth is the only thing worth striving for. Then will come pride in their possessions, envy of those who have greater contempt and suspicion for those who have less, and so an end to their happiness. I had never before seen children growing up in a state of nature, and I made full use of the rare opportunity. I spent most of my time with them, played on shore with them, went fishing and swimming with them, and found in the experience something better than a renewal of boyhood, because of a keener sense of beauty, 
a more conscious, mature appreciation of the happiness one has in the simplest kinds of pleasures. Sometimes we started on our excursions at dawn. Sometimes we made them by moonlight. I became a collector of shells in order to give some purpose to our expeditions along the reef. I couldn't have chosen a better interest, for they knew all about shells, where and when to find the best ones, and they could indulge their love of giving to a limitless extent. In the afternoons we went swimming in the lagoon. There I saw them at their best and happiest, in an element as necessary and familiar to them as it is to their parents. It is always a pleasure to watch children at play in the water, but those Palmatuan youngsters, with their natural grace at swimming and diving, put one under an enchantment. Many of the boys had water glasses and small spears of their own and went far from shore catching fish. They lay face down on the surface of the water, swimming easily with a great economy of motion, turning their heads now and then for a breath of air. And when they saw their prey, they dived after it as skillfully as their fathers do, and with nearly as much success. Seen against the bright floor of the lagoon, with swarms of brilliantly colored fish scattering before them, they seemed doubtfully human, the children of some forsaken merman rather than creatures who have need of air to breathe and solid earth to stand on. If education is the suitable preparation for life, the children of the atolls have it at its best and happiest without knowing that it is education. They are skillful in their pursuits and learn it in the interests which touch their lives and one can wish them no better fortune than that they may remain in ignorance of those which do not. Their parents, as I have said, are but children of mature stature, with the same gift of frank, generous laughter, the same delight in the new and strange. Very little is required to amuse them, I had a mandolin which I used to take ashore with me at various atolls, after I had become convinced that their enjoyment of my music was not feigned. At first I was suspicious, for I had no illusions about my virtuosity, and even when I thought of it in the most flattering way, their pleasure seemed out of all proportion to the quality of the performance but there was no doubting the genuineness of it. The whole village would assemble to hear me play. I had a limited repertoire, but that seemed to matter very little. They liked to hear the same tunes played over and over again. I learned some of the old missionary hymns which they knew, from Greenland's icy mountains, Oh Happy Day were marching to Zion and others. It was strange to find those songs, belonging fortunately to a bygone period in English and American life, living still in that remote part of the world, not because of anything universal in their appeal, but merely because they had been carried there years ago by representatives of the missionary societies. Many eccentric changes had been made in both the rhythm and melody, greatly to the improvement of both, but no amount of changing could make them other than what they are, the uncouth expression of a narrow and ugly kind of religious sentiment. I don't think the Palmatuans cared much for them either. They always seemed glad to turn from them to their own songs which have nothing either of modern or old-time missionary feeling. A woman usually began the singing, in a high-pitched nasal or throaty voice, which she modulated in an extraordinary way. 
Immediately, other women joined in, then several men whose voices were of tenor quality, followed by other men in basses and baritones, chanting in two or three tones, which for rhythm and tone quality were like the beating of kettle drums. The weird blending of harmonics was unlike anything I had ever heard before. There is nothing in our music which even remotely resembles theirs, so that it is impossible to describe the effect of the full chorus. Some of the songs make a strong appeal to savage instincts. The less resolute of the early missionaries, hearing them, must have thrown up their hands in despair at the thought of the long, difficult task of conversion awaiting them. But if there were any irresolute missionaries, they were evidently overruled by their sterner brothers and sisters. On nearly every island, there is now a church, either Protestant or Catholic. In the Protestant ones, the native population practice the only true faith, largely to the accompaniment of this old barbaric music. Those unsightly little structures rock to the sound of exultant choruses, which ought never to be sung within doors. The Palmatuans themselves know best the natural settings for their songs. The lagoon beach, with a great fire of coconut husks, blazing in the center of the group of singers. I like to hear them from a distance where I could get their full effect. To look on from the schooner, lying a few hundred yards offshore. All the inhabitants of the village would be gathered within the circle of the firelight, which brought their figures and the white straight stems of the coconut palms into clear relief against a background of deep shadow. The singing continued far into the night, so that I often fell asleep while listening and heard the music dying away, mingling at last with the interminable booming of the surf. By degrees we worked slowly through the heart of the archipelago, pursuing a general southeasterly course, the islands becoming more and more scattered, until we had before us an expanse of ocean almost unbroken to the coast of South America but to now lay at the edge of it, and at length on a lowering April day, we set out on that last leg of our outward journey. The Caleb S. Windship lay very low in the water. By that time she had a full cargo of copra, one hundred tons in the hold, and twelve sacked on deck. A portion of the deck cargo was lost that same afternoon, during a gale of wind and rain which burst upon us with fury and followed us with a seeming malignity of intent. We ran before it far out of our course for three hours. To me, the weight of air was something incredible, an unusually vigorous flourish of the departing hurricane season. Water spouted out of the scuppers in a continuous stream, and loose articles were swept clear of the ship, disappearing at once in a cloud of blinding rain. There was a fearful racket in the cabin of rolling biscuit tins and smashing crockery. Then an 800-pound safe broke loose and started to imitate Victor Hugo's cannon. Luckily, it hadn't much scope and no smooth runway, so that it was soon brought to a halt by Ruau, the old Palmatuan woman, who was the only one below at the time. She made an effective barricade of copra sacks and bedding, dodging the plunging monster with an agility surprising in a woman of sixty. But what I remember best was Tanay, a monkey belonging to one of the sailors, skidding along the cabin deck until he was blown against the engine room whistle, which rose just clear of the forward end of it. 
He wrapped arms and legs about it in his terror, opening the valve in some way, and the shrill blast rose high above the mighty roar of the wind, like the voice of man lifted with awe-inspiring impudence in defiance of the mindless anger of nature. The storm blew itself out toward sundown, and the night fell clear, a night for stars to make one wary of thought. But the moon rose about nine, softening the pitiless distances, throwing a veil of mild light across the black voids in the Milky Way, seen so clearly in those latitudes. The schooner was riding a heavy swell, and burdened as she was, rose clumsily to it, sticking her nose into the slope of every sea. Ruau was at her accustomed place against the cabin ventilator, unmindful of the showers of spray, maintaining her position on the slanting deck with the skill of three months' practice. The thought that I must soon bid her goodbye saddened me for I knew there was small chance that I should ever meet her again. I envied Crichton his opportunity for friendship with that noble old woman, so proud of her race, so true to her own beliefs, to her own way of living. Her type is none too common among Polynesians in these days. One gets all too frequently an impression of a consciousness of inferiority on their part, a sense of shame because of their simple way of living as compared with ours. Ruau was not guilty of it. She never could be, I think, under any circumstances. I learned afterward of an attempt which had been made to convert her to Christianity during her stay at Tahiti. Evidently, she had not been at all convinced by the priest's arguments, and when he made some slighting remark about the ghosts and spirits, which were so real to her, she refused to listen any longer. Frightened though she was of spirits, she was not willing that they should be ridiculed. We sighted her at all at dawn, such a dawn as one rarely sees outside the tropics. The sky was overcast at a great height, with a film of luminous mist, through which the sun shone wanly, throwing a sheen like a dust of gold on the sea. Masses of slate-colored cloud billowed out from the high canopy, overhanging a black fringe of land which lay just below the line of the horizon. The atoll was elliptical in shape, about eight miles long by five broad. There were seven widely separated islands on the circle of reef, and one small motu in the lagoon. We came into the wind about a half mile offshore and put off in the whale boat. The sea was still running fairly high, and the roar of the surf came across the water with a sound as soothing as the fall of spring rain. But it increased in volume as we drew in, until the ears were stunned by the crash of tremendous combers, which toppled and fell sheer over the ledge of the reef. It was by far the most dangerous-looking landing place we had seen on the journey. There was no break in the reef, only a few narrow indentations where the surf spouted up in clouds of spray. Between the breaking of one sea and the gathering of the next, the water poured back over a jagged wall of rock, bared for an instant to an appalling depth. Only a native crew could have managed that landing. We rode comber after comber, the sailors backing on their oars, awaiting the word of the boat steerer who stood with his feet braced on the gunwales, his head turned over his shoulder, watching the following seas. 
All at once he began shouting at the top of his voice. I looked back in time to see a wall of water on the point of breaking rising high above us. It fell just after it passed under us, and we were carried forward across the edge of the reef through the inner shallows to the beach. The two traders started off at once on a tour of inspection, and we saw nothing more of them until late in the evening. Meanwhile, I went with Ruau and Crichton across the island to the lagoon beach where her house was. As in most of the atolls, the ground was nearly free from undergrowth, the soil affording nourishment only to the trees and a few hardy shrubs. Coconuts and dead fronds were scattered everywhere. A few half-wild pigs, feeding on the shoots of sprouted nuts, gazed up with an odd air of incredulity, of amazement as we approached, then galloped off at top speed and disappeared far in the distance. Ruau stopped when we were about halfway across and held up her hand for silence. A bird was singing somewhere, a melodious, varied song like that of the hermit thrush. I had heard it before and had once seen the bird, a shy, solitary little thing, one of the few species of land birds found on the atolls. While we were standing there, listening to the faint music, Crichton took me by the arm. He said nothing, and in a moment withdrew his hand. I was deeply moved by that manifestation of friendliness, an unusual one for him to make. He had some unaccountable defect in his character, which kept him aloof from any relationship approaching real intimacy. I believe he was constantly aware of it, that he had made many futile attempts to overcome it. It may have been that which first set him on his wanderings, now happily at an end. It was plain to me the moment we set foot on shore that he would have to seek no farther for asylum. To now is one of the undoubted ends of the earth. No one would ever disturb him there. He himself was not so sure of this. Once, I remember, when we were looking at the place on the chart, he spoke of the island of Pitcairn, the old-time refuge of the bounty mutineers. Before the opening of the Panama Canal, it had been as far removed from contact with the outside world as an island could be. Now, it lies not far off the route through the canal to New Zealand, and is visited from time to time by the crews of tramp steamers and schooners. Tanau, however, is much farther to the north, and there is very slight possibility that its empty horizons will ever be stained by a smudge of smoke. As for an actual visit, one glance at the reef through the binoculars would convince any skipper of the folly of the attempt. Even our own crew of natives, skilled at such hazardous work, came to grief in their second passage over it. They had gone out to the schooner for supplies Crichton had ordered. A few sacks of flour, some canned goods, and kerosene oil. In coming back, the boat had been swept broadside against a ledge of rock. It stuck there, just at the edge of the reef, and the sailors jumped out with the line before the next wave came, capsizing the boat and carrying it inshore, bottom up. All the supplies were swept into deep water by the backwash and lost. There had been a similar accident at the other atoll. Flour and rice brought so many thousands of miles, having been spoiled within a few yards of their destination. I remember the natives plunging into the water at great risk to themselves, 
to save a few sacks of soggy paste, in the hope that a little of the flour in the center might still be dry. And a Chinese storekeeper, to whom it was consigned, standing on the shore, wringing his hands in dumb grief. And the sight brought home to me a conception of the tragic nature of such accidents to the inhabitants of those distant islands. Crichton took his own loss calmly, concealing whatever disappointment he may have felt. Ruau was not at all concerned about it, and while we were making an examination of the house, went out on the lagoon in a canoe and caught more than enough fish for supper. Then we found that all of our matches had been spoiled by seawater, so we could make no fire. Judging by the way Crichton brightened up at his discovery, one would have thought the loss a piece of luck. He set to work at once to make an apparatus for kindling fire, but before it was finished, Ruau had the fish cleaned and spread out on a coverlet of green leaves. We ate them raw, dipping them first into a sauce of coconut milk, and for dessert had a salad made of the heart of a tree. I don't remember ever having eaten with heartier appetite, but at the same time I could not imagine myself enjoying an unrelieved diet of coconuts and fish for a period of ten years. Crichton, however, was used to it, and Ruau had never known any other, except during her three months' stay at Tahiti, where she had eaten strange hot food which had not agreed with her at all, she said. Dusk came on us as we sat over our meal. Ruau sat with her hands on her knees, leaning back against a tree, talking to Crichton. I understood nothing of what she was saying, but it was a pleasure merely to listen to the music of her voice. It was a little below the usual register of women's voices, strong and clear, but softer even than those of the Tahitians, and so flexible that I could follow every change in mood. She was telling Crichton of the tupapaku of her atoll, which she dreaded most, although she knew that it was the spirit of one of her own sons. It appeared in the form of a dog, with legs as long and thick as the stem of a full-grown coconut tree, and a body proportionally huge. It could have picked up her house as an ordinary dog would a basket. Once it had stepped lightly over it, without offering to harm her in any way. Her last son had been drowned while fishing by moonlight, on the reef outside the next island, which lay about two miles distant across the eastern end of the lagoon. She had seen the dog three times since his death, and always at the same phase of the moon. Twice she had come upon it lying at full length on the lagoon beach, its enormous head resting on its paws. She was so badly frightened, she said, that she fell to the ground, incapable of further movement. Sick at heart, too, at the thought that the spirit of the bravest and strongest of all her sons must appear to her in that shape. It was clear that she was recognized, for each time the dog began beating its tail on the ground as soon as it saw her. Then it got up, yawned and stretched, took a long drink of salt water, and started at a lope up the beach. She could see it very plainly in the bright moonlight, Soon it broke into a run, going faster and faster, gathering tremendous speed by the time it reached the other end of the island. From there it made a flying spring, and she last saw it as it passed high in the air, across the face of the moon, its head outstretched, its legs doubled close under its body. 
She believed that it crossed the two-mile gap of water which separated the islands in one gigantic leap. That is the whole of the story as Crichton translated it for me. Although there must have been other details, for Rual gave her account of it at great length. Her earnestness of manner was very convincing and left no doubt in my mind of the realness to her of the apparition. As for myself, if I could have seen ghosts anywhere, it would have been at Tanao. Late that night, walking alone on the lagoon beach, I found that I was keeping an uneasy watch behind me. The distant thunder of the surf sounded at times, like a wild galloping on the hard sand, and the gentle slapping of little waves nearby, like the lapping tongue of the ghostly dog having its fill of seawater. We left Tanao with a fair wind the following afternoon, having been delayed in getting away because of the damaged whaleboat, which had to be repaired on shore. Tino, the supercargo, insisted on pushing off at once the moment the work was finished. Crichton and Ruau were on the other beach at the time, so that I had no opportunity to say goodbye, but as we were getting underway, I saw him emerge from the deep shadow and stand for a moment, his hand shading his eyes, looking out toward the schooner. I waved, but evidently he didn't see me, for there was no response. Then he turned, walked slowly up the beach, and disappeared among the trees. For three hours I watched the atoll dwindling and blurring, until at sunset it was lost to view under the rim of the southern horizon. Looking back across the space of empty ocean, I imagined that I could still see it dropping farther and farther away, down the reverse slope of a smooth curve of water, as though it were vanishing for all time beyond the knowledge and the concern of men. And with that conclusion of Crichton's story, I think we'll end this evening's reading from Fairy Lands of the South Seas. This book was originally recommended by one of your fellow listeners, and I'm so glad he did. It's really fun to read, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, you can drop me an email on our website, www.boringbookspod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night. <laughs>